Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this message. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. And if you're new here, consider subscribing to stay up to date with all of our great content. Thanks again for checking out this message. We pray it is a blessing to you. So, we're preaching through the book of James. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole spiel of who James is and what's going on here. Uh, watch it online. Um, we went through that the first week. It took me a long time to go through one verse. So, uh, we're jumping into chapter 2 um, this week. Chapter 2, 1 through 13. Uh, and if you're taking notes, the title for today is Favoritism Doesn't Fit Believers. Favoritism doesn't fit believers doesn't make sense for them. We all have a tendency, though, to have prejudice or to prejudge based on what we see. The problem is we're bad judges. With sinful hearts and wrong views. And so we make, we make poor judges, but we still make judgments, which makes them poor judgments. And us judges with evil thoughts, the Bible would say. And God looks at us differently than we look at each other. And we should come into alignment with his view. We judge off of face value or or, um, what we see right in front of us right away. But God judges on a deeper level. In fact, he says so in 1 Samuel chapter 16. The prophet Samuel is going to anoint the new king because the king of the time, Saul, is wicked. And so he goes to this family that God's called him to go to. It says when they arrived, Samuel saw, so he sees the sons of Jesse, and he's called to anoint one of the sons of Jesse as the next king. And it says when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me, or or excuse me, before the Lord. So Samuel's standing there. What he sees brings forth this thought, and he's making a a statement about who's qualified, who God calls, who he anoints to do his service based on his first impression, his view, his sight of this person before him. This is like a man of God. He's the prophet. Still has a tendency to do that. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height what he looks like, his stature, for I have rejected him. So you were just about to, if you didn't listen to God on this, you were just about to anoint him as the king. You were about to put an anointing on him for this special chosen qualification, this role, based on what you saw, but God had made a different decision. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. Praise God. Most of us in this room are in bad trouble. If that was the case, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And and as Samuel kind of gets put into a proper check here to say you were about to just decide based off first impressions on appearance who God would call, who he would choose. You were going to bless someone based off what you saw, but God's the one that gets to choose those things. He sees at a deeper level than us. We should have a view that's more like God's. Jesus would say in Matthew, when talking about false prophets that would come or false teachers, um, to judge them by their fruit. We tend to judge by the face of things. God looks at the fruit and at the heart. He looks at a deeper level of what's going on. James is going to speak Uh, pretty firmly to us as believers that we shouldn't show favoritism. In fact, he will say that favoritism or partiality is a sin. Let's read it. James 2, 1 through 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. 
Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? And not the ones who are, are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the neighbor? No, I can't even talk today. This is going to be a problem if I can't read. <laughs> are they not the ones who are blaspheming the na noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank God. But this is good for us, and this isn't um, me coming to you saying like, oh man, we really miss it as a church and trying to just admonish us as a church. Um, but James speaks pretty firmly because all of us are tempted to prejudge and pretend as if our analysis that quickly is the correct one instead of asking God what to do with what's before us. Am I the only one that has a tendency to have to fight that? Believers must not show favoritism. Write that down. Must not. James, again, um, I'll say what I've said every week so far in this. James isn't super interested in your feelings. <laughs> James just comes at you. And James, what he's really trying to drive home, what we, what we ended with last week, is he says this is religion that is pure, that is faultless before the Lord. And when he says religion, he means genuine faith. He's saying this is what it means to really have a relationship with God. It drives through you. He expects that genuine faith promotes or pushes towards real fruit in your life, real genuine love in your life. The genuine faith would drive genuine action. And he has some hard things to say about those whose actions don't line up with what they profess. In fact, he would push it as far as to say, like, you profess, but I don't think you possess faith in Christ. So you say it with your mouth, but your actions are saying your heart hasn't been changed at all. And that's a scary place to be. Believers must not show favoritism. My brothers and sisters, so he says those that follow Christ, the family, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. That's an awesome statement. That's my brothers and sisters in Christ. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Remember that. The Lord of glory. The believers must not show favoritism. He doesn't say you shouldn't. He doesn't say try not to. He says it's not fitting for you. It's not for you at all. Believers must not show favoritism or partiality, which actually means, like in its literal sense, receive the face. Receive the face. That you would see someone and judge them based off what you can just see initially right away. You receive them based on what you see on the face. Jesus would go after the Pharisees over and over and over again saying, you're a whitewashed tomb. Inside is the bones of dead men. Like, it's nasty in there. But you put on a front so that you appear holy before everybody. He would say to them, you wash the outside of the dish 
and not the inside. So the inside of you is gross, but you look all right from out here. And you'd say, wash the inside, the outside will take care of itself. If the inside's clean, the outside, it'll be taken care of. Because he knows that we, we put on appearances. And in church, we can, be, we can be tempted to make it all about the appearance of holiness, the appearance of a relationship with God. And James would say, listen, it's not just about the face, and we judge wrong when we judge by the face. He would say, look at the fruit of your life. Does it really come out of you? Is, it, is, it, is the, the regeneration of your heart driving a new life that drives new action, new desires, new purpose on a new mission? Or did you just put that on because it sounds right to say? Must not just receive the face or judge or accept just on the face. Suppo and then he's going to give an example of this. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. Gold ring. This is some uh, statement of status, right? This person has some wealth. And really, this kind of speaks to the glory of man that we would try to put on and show an appearance so that others would think more of us. And this isn't necessarily a statement against those that are rich or those that are poor as much as the fact that we're wicked in our hearts and how we judge them. There are righteous rich people. There are wicked rich people. There are righteous poor people. There are wicked poor people. There are righteous and wicked middle class So the idea is that we try to put a righteous or wickedness, we lay a label on somebody because of how we see them in accordance with the way they fit into the world's structures instead of how God looks at people. And here it says, okay, he's the glorious one, Jesus Christ. He's the one that we glorify, but in comes somebody that has this appearance, this, this the, kind of the glory of man that comes out. This isn't saying you can't come in with fine clothes and a gold ring. If you're here right now stunting, I'm not trying to come at you. It's just to say it's more than that. And a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. He used the word filthy earlier in James, speaking of moral filth that we should get rid of. But he wants to make sure we're not associating them with each other. Because you could have dirty clothes and a clean heart. Or you could have clean clothes and a dirty heart. And too often we connect them even though they're not connected. So in this story, in this example, he says, you must not show favoritism. He gives these, okay, these two men come into the assembly or your gathering the word here is, is really like synagogue, but it's not necessarily that it was in a synagogue. It's where they, wherever they would gather. For us, in the current context of our day, it would be coming to a church service. And they come from different socioeconomic spaces. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you. This is almost speaks to like the connect team or the ushers, right? But really it connects to all of us. If you show preferential treatment and you discriminate based off the way that somebody walked in through the doors, he'll say, We're, you're, you made yourself a judge. You took a role that's not yours and you did it with an evil heart or evil thoughts, evil motives. Say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Listen to this. Two men come in. One's got the gold ring. He's flossing. Somebody else comes in, a, a poor man in dirty clothes or filthy clothes, it says. It says, if you treat them differently, and, and in this example, it says, to the, to the one that looks like they have status or, or socioeconomic advantage, you would say, take this seat, this good seat, this excellent seat. We have a special place just for you and people like you. 
And you would say to the poor man, stand, you don't have a chair. Stand over there or sit at my feet. Either push to the corner or act like a servant. Have you not discriminated or made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Hmm. Become judges. We put our place in that space. The Old Testament would speak regularly about making sure that justice is had that the poor weren't pushed to the side or dealt with harshly because they couldn't stick up for themselves, they didn't have any power in the structure, and that you wouldn't favor those that were rich because of their power, because of their status, because of maybe what it could return to you. In fact, in Leviticus 19, verse 15, it said, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great but judge your neighbor fairly. It's clear in the courthouse, but it's also called for the congregation. That we would deal with each other, our neighbors, in a proper way, as image bearers of God, as those that would come seeking to be in his presence, learn from his word, understand fellowship among each other, but we are wicked in our hearts sometimes, and we tend to show favoritism. And let's be honest, oftentimes it has to do with whatever feels comfortable for us because we see everything through a biased lens of where we're at. So if we're poor, we can discriminate against the rich. If we're rich, we can discriminate against the poor. Should I go on? We could go towards politics, socioeconomics, color of skin. Should I go on? We can. We can list all the different things that the world tries to break us apart from, but that Christ says that when we come together, there is neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, but that all are one in Christ. And that the the congregations, the assemblies of believers should look differently than the world that makes all of these status claims and value claims on face value when we come together in faith. We put that to the side. We look different than the world. We honor everybody that walks through the door. We love everybody that comes to the door. Why? Because we're not interested in just the glory of man or the appearance of glory. We're interested in glorifying God, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. We do so by loving everybody and not discriminating against some because of how it might feel comfortable for us or how it might benefit us. We're most interested in how it can glorify God. And you know what? It's interesting here. Um, this is a real thing. This really, hap- this, this really happens. Um, I can speak from experience uh, of Brianna and I going somewhere once for a conference. And... Um, We saw as they said a hi to us and where they were seating people, specifically because they had cameras in certain areas where they wanted to pick up the crowd while the preacher was preaching. You could see them moving people when they came in and asking some people to sit up front because of the way they would look on the camera. Are you flipping kidding me? In doing so, we're we're making this line of favoritism that is wrong. That is wrong. And so James will come right at us and say not to show favoritism. Jesus was known as being one that was not a respecter of men. That doesn't mean he didn't show respect. He showed respect. It meant that your status didn't matter when it came to him speaking the truth. And that he would show care and love for the woman caught in adultery or the woman at the well or the tax collector or the obvious sinner among them. 
Just like he would deal with them in truth and in grace and in love, just like he would deal with the others in truth and grace and love that were of higher status. I mean, he was coming to everybody's sin. He would say, go and sin no more to the one caught in sin right now. But he would also look at the one that everybody thought was holy and be like, you're wicked. In fact, look at this. Um, they're coming to trap Jesus in his words, or they're trying to, in Matthew 22, verse 16. They sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, the teacher. They said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others. Why? Because you pay no attention to who they are. How beautiful is that? He's like this, this statement of who he is. You're a man of integrity. Why? Because you teach the truth. You, you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You're not doing it based on who's there or how it might come across. You have integrity because you preach the truth. You also have integrity because you're not swayed by those around you to try to gain some sort of preference of some sort of return. But you just say it how it is because it doesn't matter to you. If it's the person that's viewed as, as an outsider or an outcast or the person that has the inside track, you're going to deal with them as a, an image bearer. One that needs to hear the gospel, needs to hear the truth, needs exposure to you, Jesus. We're called to do the same. It's an interesting thing, though. You can easily feel the tension of like if somebody shows up at a church service, this happens, this happens in real life. If a professional athlete walks through a door or a celebrity in whatever world a celebrity is a celebrity to you, walks through the door, would you not be tempted to in that moment show them preferential treatment and discriminate unto them? Show them favoritism. You don't know them. You don't know what's going on. But wouldn't we be tempted? Oh my gosh, that's fill in the blank. <laughs> Somebody go get them a cup of coffee. Hey, go get them a water. Hey, I'm going to go clear out a row for them. That's, hey, listen, if, if you are going to do that, I'm down with it. You just got to do it for everybody. For the person you've never heard of, never seen, and the society looks past, okay. look at them. Realize who they might be. Go get them coffee. Get them a water. Clear out a row. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. But let us not view it in the way that the world views it. My concern is the way that we can sometimes judge, where would we place Jesus if he walked in the door? In Isaiah 53, when talking about Jesus, there's no special appearance about him. Jesus, when, when asked about following him, says, like foxes have dens, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Basically, like I'm rolling through town. I like, I like sleep where I can. I'm like homeless. So you really want to follow me? So if Jesus comes in and you don't know him by name, if it's just Jesus looking like Jesus looked, where does he get seated in the scenario? Jesus, sit at my feet, stand over there in the corner. Hmm. Something to wrestle with. Again, this is not me just trying to admonish as a church. I think we do a mostly great job. And let's always be aware of the wickedness of the flesh and of the heart that could change that in us in a moment. Because it's easy for you to say it wouldn't happen until it happens. Until somebody comes in that you want to have favor with. Listen, when somebody comes in that has status, if you show them favor, they tend to show you favor. And so there's this temptation to want to do so. Also, when it says give the, the you know, they, if you give a good seat to those that, that come in with all the stuff, if we're just honest, the weakness of our own heart, the reason that we want riches and we want to have those things is because we want preferential treatment. We won't be able to look at us and go like, they're great, give them something. So we can relate. Huh. 
How you guys doing? We're a couple verses into this bad boy. <laughs> Listen, not only we must not show favoritism, um, but when we have shown favoritism, we tend to choose poorly. Again, if we look at that Samuel verse we looked at earlier, we're not going to look at it right now, but as we already did. But Samuel says he saw and he thought, this has got to be the one. And God says, hey, man, stop looking at that. I look at the heart. I have one that I've called to be the king. And look at this in James 2, 5, in the beginning of 6. It says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Hmm. God doesn't choose the same way the world chooses. Like, let's be real. If you were choosing your team of like greatest impact in the world, I won't put it on you. If most people... were choosing to go out and try to impact the world, they would look for the strongest, the most high status, greatest influence in and of themselves to go and do that. But God chooses people like me and you to go push forth his kingdom in the world. People of lowly status. That doesn't mean that God doesn't also save those that have great status and have things going for them. That's not at all. But he regularly saves those, chooses those to be on his team that we would not choose if we were the one choosing. And so when we do choose, we choose poorly and it's not in accordance with who he is and what he's done. This is you dishonor those that God chose. Think about that for a minute. God chooses somebody to be a son or daughter of his, and we would be like, go stand on the side. Sit at my feet. Some of you, this hits really close to home because God has chosen you, and you've had to work through seeing favoritism or partiality work against you. Hmm. Has not God chosen, God chosen, those who are poor in the eyes of the world, to be rich in faith. Showing that the eyes of the world and the eyes of believers, like we see different things. Faith should matter to us more than finances ever do. And to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. Again, this is not a statement about if it's right or wrong to be rich or poor. We see Guys, rich in scripture, that if if this was saying rich people are evil, only poor people are saved by God, then you would have to throw out a lot of people in scripture that are clearly God's people. A lot of the Old Testament guys that God blessed ridiculously, or those that are, are called, like Joseph of Arimathea, who's like this great follower of Jesus who has this place to bury him, and, and it, it is like awesome that he has the ability to do so. But what the statement is that we judge poorly. We judge on appearance. God looks to the heart. We judge off the face instead of the faith and the fruit. And that we do so poorly. And that we dishonor those often that God has chosen. And God chooses those from broken circumstances all the time. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. Paul says to the church in Corinth, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Go ahead. Think of what you were when you were called. The Bible has some words about you. An enemy of God. Dead in your sin and trespasses. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. 
God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So you can't go, God save me because I'm awesome. But even those that think they're awesome, he would put in check and need a savior as much as anybody else. This is such good news for us. That God brings us onto his team, puts us onto his mission, even though the world might look at us from a whole different perspective. The world might push us to the side. They might see us as, as, uh, as worldly poor, but we're rich in faith. We have an inheritance that is great because of who our father is. And that we should be excited about what God has for us. I love when speaking of the disciples, they, they get called before the courts and, and when they're talking about these guys and what to do with them, they say like, these guys aren't educated. They're not learned men, but they've been with Jesus. So they have this power in the ministry that they're doing because of whom they've been in contact with, who's imparted in them. Who's working through them? Let's be encouraged. Let's also, as we're encouraged that God works through us, let us check our hearts, hearts according to his word and let's make sure we have a genuine faith that is driven out in real actions. And that it is not fitting for us. We cannot show favoritism among ourselves or we are showing that our hearts are still not in alignment with who he says we're called to be as believers. So he'll say that we tend to choose poorly. And then he'll talk about, James will, favoritism. um, And that our favoritism is not only poorly chosen, but it opposes logic and it opposes the law. Like it doesn't even make sense. And it opposes the law. So the people of that day um, are being persecuted heavily, Christians are. And those that are persecuting them and dragging them before the courts are those with power, oftentimes with financial status that are mocking them, speaking poorly about Jesus Christ, bringing them into the courts to take advantage of them financially, but also to make them be persecuted. And so he would say, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him who is, uh, uh, of him to whom you belong? That James would say, listen, not only do you choose poorly when you try to choose based off of appearances and you think people are like holy because they look like it on the outside and you are pushing people to the side that God has chosen and you're missing it completely, but the way that you do it doesn't even make sense. Like people that are exploiting you, you're making a special place for among you. And you're, you're not understanding that, that the rich are the ones that have been oppressing you and now you're like making them something special and, and it, it doesn't even make logical sense. So you do it not in accordance to God's view and you do it not according to what even makes any logical sense. He'll go on and say favoritism um, that opposes the law. Look at this. I gotta move a little quicker because I stayed at the beginning a long time, which is good. That's kind of the crux of what we're talking about. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture or according to scripture and royal law, there is like the supreme law, the kingdom law. If you really keep the the king's law found in scripture, according to scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. We know that Jesus speaks on what is, what's the greatest command mean? In fact, it's in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Yes, please. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. I saw a pastor said this week, we don't mind loving our neighbors. We just want to pick the neighborhood. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> we want to discriminate on who is uh, among us, around us. God, I love my neighbor. Just let me pick who the neighbors get to be. 
can go back to the James 6 thing. So he says the royal law that everything else kind of falls under, right? Everything hangs on these. Love God with everything. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do the, that, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Now this is an interesting thing because we don't like to do this. We like to say I broke that law, not that I broke the law. I only broke that law. No, you broke the law. We do that. In fact, when thinking of our holiness, when we try to track it and go like, well, I don't know, I've been pretty good here. I've only done a little bit bad over here. And we try to justify our uh, own behaviors. We tend to view the things that we do correctly really high and kind of minimize the things that we miss. It's an evangelistic tool of kind of apologetic street, street evangelism where people will say, um, no, I'm, I'm actually a pretty good person. Why? Because you minimize the things you've done. You break that law and you don't understand that means you're a lawbreaker. And so oftentimes what happens in the conversations on the street, uh, street evangelism is, um, I, I'm a pretty good person. Oh yeah? Um, have you ever lied? Yes. What do we call a person that lies? A liar. You're a liar. I don't like that. I'm not a liar. I'm just a person that lies. And then you can go even further than that. You have, have you committed adultery? Many people, if they don't say yes, will say no. And then they'll say, well, ever, have you ever lusted after someone in your heart? Jesus says that's, an, like, that's committed adultery in your heart. Oh, I guess I have done that. So you're an adulterer. No. <laughs> yes. You have a murder? Most people on the street will say no. If you had anger against your brother, Jesus says, if you have anger against your brother or sister, you're a murderer. You're a murderer. <laughs> the whole goal of that kind of back and forth is to help us understand that we minimize what we have done against God, sure. what we've done against each other. We minimize, not, unless somebody does it against us, then we maximize it. But if we've done it, we minimize it and we kind of, no, but I do this and I do this and I do this. So what he's saying here is, listen, we tend to go, I'm good everywhere except for here. So I think I'm actually good. And he would say, no, that makes you a lawbreaker. That makes you a lawbreaker. And so you're not in accordance with loving your neighbor, even if you do all these things to them, but you show favoritism at them, you're breaking the law. And you're not in accordance. You're called to follow the law of liberty, the law of freedom. You're called to love everybody with the royal law. Love them. And it's not loving to somebody to judge them because of the clothes they walked in on and push them to the side or judge them on what they're wearing and exalt them in a way that doesn't fit. Let's keep moving. I should probably have the worship team come up. Judgment of our actions. This is difficult. James was saying, verse 12 and 13, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. That doesn't seem very freeing if you're going to be judged by it. The law that gives, the law of liberty, the law that gives freedom. Speak and act. What you say, what you do, as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We know that those that are in Christ Jesus, for those that are in Christ Jesus, there is now no longer condemnation before the Lord. James will continue in the text to say, make sure you're actually in Christ Jesus. 
Make sure, like you should have a genuine faith that drives you somewhere. To actually believe in Christ and be transformed is to be a new person with new desires and new actions, live a new life with a new mission and a new purpose. It's that kind of transformative when the spirit of God comes to dwell in you. And he has great concern that you could profess with your mouth that you believe in Jesus, but not possess a real faith in Jesus Christ that would drive your actions. And so when he speaks on the fact you'll be judged on your speech and your actions, there's two different ways to kind of look at this. One of them is the, uh, the rewards given to believers. There is no condemnation, but that there is kind of this blessing and judgment of what comes out of us as believers. The other is to understand that maybe you should reconcile or work through why isn't it transforming my life? Why am I okay with saying I love Jesus, but showing favoritism and I'm not feeling convicted to change that? James wants to drive down like talk is cheap. If you're really about it, be about it. Now, does that mean we do it perfectly all the time? No, thank God for his grace as he is doing a work in us to perfect us, but by the grace of God, as we see that in ourselves, we are quick to repent, quick to remember the cross of Christ where we have been forgiven and reminded of who we are now in him that we no longer do those things that we used to do when we were in the world. But we have been transformed, living a new life unto him. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Two things I want to show you real quick. In Romans 2, 6 through 11. Paul says to the church in Rome, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, God's glory, glory in God, honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, so some seek glory in him, some seek self, and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism that he's going to deal with those actions that were covered by the blood of Christ Jesus, but he's constantly pushing us to say, like, if you're persisting in evil, you're missing it. If you're persisting in evil and you're self-seeking, then you're not seeking the correct thing, and you might have just given lip service to something that you heard and parroted it back, but you haven't actually put a saving faith in Christ Jesus that would be transformative. And there's this balance where I'm not trying to scare everybody in the room to say, like a new believer that's still wrestling through everything and trying to fix it or figure it out. Um, I'm not trying to like put out that little candle. Also, I'm not trying to make you feel safe and secure when you haven't actually put faith in Jesus. But that it's a transformative thing that happens to us as we've been regenerated, that we should look like Christ, that we should really live this life out. James will continue to drive it home. He'll continue to kick us in the teeth. And he gets that from his older half-brother, Jesus. Jesus is the one that says the statement, like, if you don't show mercy, you won't get mercy. And when Jesus says it, he speaks on it about forgiving your brothers because understanding why. You're you're dealing with their filth. You're dealing with what's on them. Don't forget that I've dealt with your filth. Don't forget that I've dealt with the stuff going on in you, your wickedness, the darkness, the debt in which you owe. And extend that same sort of grace, that same sort of mercy to other people that has been given to you, that he accepted you right where you were at. He brought you in through Christ. Right where you were is where he drew you to himself. You don't have to put on the the gold ring and all the stuff to look nice so that he'd call you forth to be sat at his table. No, he did that for you. You came to him dirty, broke. He cleans. He makes us whole. He draws us in. 
Again, church, I am blessed to be not only the pastor of our church, but a member of this church, just like you are. And I'm blessed to be a member of a church that I think oftentimes does a lot of this really well and always has to be aware of as a congregation, as individual believers, that we see the person in front of us we, and we love the person in front of us. We, we, we care for them sacrificially regardless of how the world might view them or how they might split any group up into their different the tribes and, and comfort zones and those things. We, we come together in Christ Jesus. It's unique, it's beautiful, it's purposed. And it's a sin to show favoritism or partiality. So let us remove that from our lives. Let us remove that from the church in any place that it might show up. Let us honor and glorify God by caring and loving for the people that come before us every single time. Can you stand to your feet?